know about you guys, but the Hillsong documentary, A Mega Church Exposed, really scared me. It really stressed me out, got my anxiety flaring about the church and the church's identity, how the world sees the church. And it got me asking questions like, could this be my church one day? Have I been in churches like this? I couldn't even make it through the whole documentary. And so today I'm gonna talk about one of the main things after pulling away for a couple days that I have realized is left out of the conversation here. Even on videos here on YouTube where people are responding to this documentary, we leave this big part out. Let's begin. <laughs> Hey friends, if you are new here, my name is Faith. I am a seminary student, a pastor's wife, and an absolute Bible nerd. I love studying theology. I love the church passionately, and I have a heart here to teach and equip people how to read and study the Bible so that they can taste and see that God is so good, that studying the word doesn't have to be this boring thing, that you can study God's word and enjoy it and feast and all of that to say, as someone here on the tube with mixed audiences, subscribers, patrons, people coming from all different traditions, all different denominations. I've seen the impact of this Hillsong church stuff. So many people are nervously scrambling. And to be honest, I think we're nervously scrambling because we're like, is this my church? Could my church fall into the same pattern? Could I fall into the same pattern? Can I like their songs? Is that even allowed? Because they're led by bad people, right? And so we get anxious, we grow nervous, and we don't know what quite to think about the whole situation. We're ashamed, we're frustrated, we're angry even, but we don't know what quite to do with this information. How do we move forward from this? But you see, one of the biggest parts of this that I feel like nobody is addressing Hello, Bessie. Bessie just <laughs> jumped into scene. Is that we shouldn't be surprised by this. We shouldn't be surprised by our sin. If you look through any of the Pauline epistles, which are basically any of the letters from Paul to churches, you see that these churches were really messed up. Look with me in first and second Corinthians. These churches were like in the center of culture. They were like in the center of attention and world and influence, much like Hillsong Church. In fact, the city of Corinth had a reputation much like Las Vegas of today. You know, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. It's kind of like Sin City and everybody goes there to kind of live out their sin, right? Corinth had that same kind of idea around it. This map is really small, but I glued in my Bible. Can you see that little tiny circle right there? That's Corinth. It's on this little tiny strip of land. What would happen here is sailors would come, they would dock, and while their ship was being trolleyed across that like short, I think it's like four mile strip of land, they would party. It would be like a two day thing, like a long weekend, they'd party, they'd live in sin, and then they'd get back on their ship and continue traveling. And they would actually save travel time by going through Corinth. And so you had the entire world coming here, traveling and sinning, right? And so we shouldn't be surprised here when we read through the two letters from Paul to the Corinthian church that they were like really into sin. They had divisions, they had open sin that they didn't know how to deal with. They had church discipline issues. They had leadership issues. I mean, everything that you can think of, I feel like the Corinthian church addressed and dealt with. Like core issues in the Christian faith are things that they struggled with, like the Lord's Supper, like the resurrection from the dead, like basic things, like struggling to be unified as a church body, basic things. In chapter five, he addresses like all this gross immorality that they're dealing with and that they're like tolerating. He says, even the Romans don't tolerate that, but you're tolerating this? In chapter six, he deals with them suing each other back and forth. Oh, chapter eight, they don't even know what they can eat and if what they're eating is right or if they can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. I mean, they're asking all of these like big questions. And in a lot of ways, we read first and second Corinthians and we don't think twice about their sin. We're not shocked. We're not disgusted. We don't get angry. It doesn't make us nervous because we're so used to seeing it here. We forget that these people, a lot of them walked on the earth in the same time that Jesus walked on the earth. And yet they are still facing really big sin, really big division, really big problems. So while we like don't want to celebrate sin going on in Hillsong, while we want justice and you know God to be glorified in the church at Hillsong Church, we also shouldn't be surprised that the enemy might be attacking a church that has huge influence on the world. And this isn't to say that this church isn't or is a cult, not to say that they weren't acting really wrongly. This is to say though that we've got so much focus on what they did wrong. Wow, justice 
justice needs to be served and wrongs need to definitely be made right. I mean, I, again, I couldn't even make it through the entire documentary because I was so heartbroken over it. I would say we, we gotta remember that we too have that same ability to be just as broken. And if we're not careful, we too will also begin to worship our own church instead of our own savior. So don't forget this truth. It should remind us of our sin. It should remind us of our absolute, incredible, desperate need for a savior. We are just as desperate for a savior. You see, we've been walking around in this dark world. We've been seeking out truth. It wasn't until Jesus came in and paid the cost for our sins that he became our head. He became our leader. He gave us direction. He gave us truth. And so do not be surprised when believers fall back into their bad patterns of sins, though they have the Holy Spirit, hopefully living and working within them. Those are our bad habits. Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do, but I continue in sin in Romans? He says, why do I do this, this war within me? Why do I continue in sin even though I hate it? We're going to face that battle. And so if you're shocked by Hillsong, and if it's making you nervous about your church or nervous about your own faith walk or your own Christianity, I encourage you, don't be so disattached from your own sinfulness that you would be shocked by this. We as believers should be more aware of our sinfulness than anyone else on planet Earth. It shouldn't be non-believers pointing and saying, oh, look at those sinners. It should be us saying, wow, look at us sinners. And yet we get to call ourselves children of God. You wanna know why? You wanna be a part of this? Let me tell you and open up our Bibles. This is the Bible right here. This, this is what this is supposed to be. <laughs> so I have no idea what lays ahead for Hillsong. I don't think Jesus is limited to just their buildings or their name or their songs by any means. I'm not super worried about it. It should be all God's anyway. But if you're looking on at Hillsong and you're getting this anxiety, this tension, this stress over why, why, how, uh, uh, and you're feeling that pain, you're feeling that sense of like mourning when believers fall into sin or suffer from the consequences of sin. Know that the Lord might be very well calling you to a greater awareness of your sinfulness and your need for a savior. Because it's so easy for us as Christians to start to believe the lies that we're better than the rest of the world. That we don't walk around in these same roads as the Corinthians. We walk in the same kind of world that's lost and seeking for satisfaction, for love, for attention, just like those in the Corinthian church. And they are ready and able to point at us and say, you guys aren't doing what you say you're doing. And that's when we can come in and say, you know what, I've done nothing, but I am only saved by what somebody else did. November 26th, I think. Joe's gonna probably comment if I say the wrong date. Joe and I were going through Cataloochee, North Carolina. It's a reserve or a preserve, and it's old historic area where there's a lot of old historic barns, houses. There's even a chapel there preserved in time. And Joe took me into that chapel. This is where his ancestors used to go and worship. We stood there behind the pulpit and he opened his Bible to Ephesians 2. And I don't know, you guys can ask him in the comments if how much significance was there, if it was just God leading him. I think we were both so nervous and unsure and excited and just in love that, I don't know, maybe he just flipped here because it's what popped in his mind. But he read, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no man can boast. They are behind the pulpit at the Catalucci Chapel. I don't know, comment down below if you've ever been there. My husband then bent down on his knee and proposed. And I didn't even let him finish his sentence. I was jumping up and down and saying, yes, 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 yes. But there we were basing our very proposal, basing our very start of our marriage on this idea that it is not by anything we've done that we have been saved. My husband and I, we can go to marriage counseling, we can go through fights, we can have disagreements with the peace of mind and the peace of heart that it is not by works that we have experienced any kind of grace or any kind of blessing. It is by Christ alone. It is by his grace bestowed upon us lavished on us that we have received the grace and the love from him that we can continue in marriage that we can fight the good fight that we can run the good race that we can stand behind the pulpit or preach the gospel or whatever i tell you this story not to make us sound super holy because we don't have a perfect marriage by any means but i tell you this story because in the same very way i want to challenge you to root your relationship 
with the church. In the same kind of way, Joe and I rooted the beginning of our marriage in the heart of the gospel that is by grace we have been saved and not of works, lest no man should boast. That's how I originally memorized it. That's totally not the translation I just read it in, but that's okay. We rooted our marriage, we rooted our relationship starting there, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Root your relationship with the church, your idea of what Christ's bride should look like. It is not by works that any of us have been saved. It is not by anything that any man can do, lest no man should boast. So that no man should ever be able to boast in what he's done is just by grace of Christ. And that, my friends, will prevent you not only from the anxiety attacks when you see churches like Hillsong go through their hardships, but also prevent you from ever thinking that you've saved yourself. And that's probably the biggest tool of the enemy, not adultery or sin or alcohol or drug abuse. No, the biggest tool of the enemy is fooling us into thinking that we've saved ourselves. And that's the biggest anti-cross lie that we could ever believe. Now, if you guys want a little bit more of an understanding about salvation, I know this was like floating over the top of these like big theological concepts. I love talking about theology. Click this video here and it will kind of get you rolling. And I will see you guys in this jam-packed video. Bye guys.